I am broadcasting <laughs> from my home in Welland in my daughter's bedroom. So I have my background blurred. Otherwise, I have, you know, pink bookshelves and fluffy purple things all over the place. Um, so thank you for joining us in this uh, this virtual world that we're all in right now. I do much prefer having these conversations in person where we can have sort of a two-way conversation, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that again at some point in the near future. Um, so I'm just going to start screen sharing. Can everybody hear me okay? If, if you can't, maybe shout out. Okay, very good. Um, I'm just going to start my screen share. And then I think depending on your settings and how you have your view, you may be able to just see my presentation or, or see the presentation and, and the people that are in the meeting. And Annie, you did start recording. I see the little red dot, so you're good? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, so welcome everyone to our How to Help Our Native Pollinators. And as Annie mentioned, my name is Carrie Royer, and I'm the coordinator of community outreach and volunteers with the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority. And my slides will start moving. Here we go. Um, so just before I begin my presentation, I would like to acknowledge that I'm currently broadcasting from my home in the city of Welland, and that this is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, many of whom continue to live and work here today. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this land is home to many First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples, and acknowledging reminds us that the great standard of living that we enjoy today is directly related to the resources and friendships of Indigenous people. So just a general overview of my presentation this evening. Um, we're going to speak a little bit about what are pollinators and some of the needs of those pollinators. Mackenzie, can you just close the door, please, sweetheart? Sorry. <laughs> um, some of the challenges that the pollinators face here in Niagara and what are native plants and what that means. Um, some of the partnerships that we've had, including some with uh, the city of Welland and some habitat initiatives that we've worked on as a conservation authority and how and everybody can play a role in uh, helping native pollinators no matter where you are um, or where you live. My daughter kindly left our dogs in her bedroom with me, so forgive <laughs> if there's barking <laughs> the joys. Um, so different types of pollinators. So this is, you know, again, where normally I would have that sort of two-way dialogue of asking, you know, what does everybody already know about pollinators? Um, but po pollinators are things like bees, butterflies, bats, birds, and then various other types of insects. And when people think about bees in Niagara, we often think about honeybees and bumblebees. Those are definitely two uh, prominent species here. But there, a lot of people don't know that we actually have over 150 different species of bees living in Niagara. Um, not all of them are native to here, but many are. Um, at Brock University, there's a, uh, a teacher who, a uh, professor who is, that's her, her life's work is working on pollinators and bees and identifying all the different species that there are around here. Um, and in this, in the photos in the, in the uh, slide here, there's a leaf from a, a red bud and it has these little half circles sort of cut out of it. And those are the result of a leaf cutter bee. And a leaf cutter bee will go in and cut the little pieces of the leaf, they'll chew around to make that sort of crescent shape or the half circle. And then they'll roll the leaf up into like a little cigar. And that's where they'll lay their eggs in the, the tiny holes in, in the stems of um, trees or in bark. And that's where they'll lay their eggs and the larvae will then feed on the, the leaves. So, you know, sometimes it's not even just the pollinators that we see, it's the results of these things in our garden. So people might think, oh no, something's eating my, my tree or my plant. Um, but these, these little cuttings don't actually hurt the leaf and the tree will, will be just fine. So I guess the, the general moral of the story is that you don't always have to spray every time you see something sort of eating your leaves, that sometimes it's a beneficial insect or something that is actually helping your garden. Um, and then we don't often think of things like birds and bats as being pollinators, but they do contribute to, to pollination as well. So some of the needs of pollinators 
Um, so forage or food is obviously one thing that we, we know. Some of them have preferences for certain types of nectar. So some bees are sp specific and they'll only eat certain types of plants or only harvest pollen or nectar from certain types of plants. And others are called generalists. So they, they'll feed on a variety of different plants. Um, some of the co common um, native, native species of plants that are good for general, generalists are things in the coneflower family, so purple coneflower, echinacea, as many people know it, or black-eyed Susan or brown-eyed Susan. Um, asters like New England or blue, uh, sky blue aster are really good sources, and New England aster is actually something that we see growing sort of on the side of the road in the fall. Um, I always see, when I see golden rods and, and New England asters, those purple flowers on the side of the road, that's always a sign of fall to me. And um, those are actually really, really important food sources for those pollinators in the fall as a lot of things are stopping um, their flowering period. That, that's the last sort of nectar source or pollen source at the end of the year for those bees and other pollinators. And then milkweeds, um, such as swamp, butterfly, and common milkweed are other important sources for those generalist species. So nesting is another um, need that they have. And so, like I mentioned, the leaf cutter bees will sort of take those little pieces of leaf and roll them up. And a lot of pollinators depend on specific types of plants and cavities, rotting logs, and other habitat features um, for laying their eggs. So um, any piece of wood that has little holes in it from a woodpecker um, can then become a habitat for a, a bee. So it it's, goes back to the, um, as a conservation authority, we often recommend that people have dead trees in their property, which many of us have lots of right now with thanks to the emerald ash borer, um, that we don't always have to cut all of those trees down unless they're posing a, ha a hazard to humans. Like if you, you're worried that it's gonna land on your house or land on somebody, but if it's in sort of the back part of a property that doesn't really get used too much, you can leave those dead standing trees and that will provide nesting habitat for pollinators and then you know other habitat features like woodpeckers and things like that that will uh, benefit from that as well. And another thing uh, that's really important for bees and butterflies is these um, these stems that we leave behind in the fall. So a lot of people in the um, in the fall they want to clean up their gardens before the winter, but it's best to leave these stems and in fact leave your garden as messy as possible in the fall. Leaf litter is good. Stems are good. These are all little things that the the creatures can crawl under and get shelter from, from the snow. And particularly um, hollow stems or pithy stems of certain types of plants where they can crawl in and get uh, refuge. Some types of pollinators need bare ground to dig into and go underground to nest. Um, so if you are putting mulch on a garden, we always recommend that you leave some bare patches at the back of the garden where you don't apply the mulch because the mulch is so thick that they can't get through in order to get on into the ground. So these are just some little uh, habitat tips for the garden. So messy is okay and I always recommend that uh, you leave those stems and that leaf litter until the last frost and although we get really excited in the spring once we start getting those warmer days to uh, to get in there and start digging stuff up and taking it out um, just kind of leave it for a little bit longer. Um, host plants. So many species like I said are, are more specific and they have a, a specific host plant so we often um, think of the monarch butterfly as an example of a species that has a very specific host plant. So that's the milkweed. And these, this um, zoomed in photo of the caterpillars is a caterpillar feeding on a milkweed plant. And they start off as these teeny tiny little creatures that you would probably not even notice on your plants. Um, and they lay their eggs singly um, on various leaves. And then they hatch and then two weeks later they turn into these pretty pretty big caterpillars um, and then they will form what's called a chrysalis. So um, a chrysalis is formed by a butterfly, a cocoon is formed by a moth. So the butterfly, the caterpillar butterfly comes out of a chrysalis. Um, and so these are examples of 
pollinators that require specific host plants. And there's, there's resources available online and I can share some as well um, that have different types of butterflies and what their host plants are if people are looking to sort of plant to those specific species. Spicebush swallowtail is another one. I believe it's on my next slide. Yeah, so this is called a spicebush swallowtail. So spicebush is a type of native shrub that has, it actually flowers before it leaves. So you see the little, in the corner, the little yellow flowers, those come out, they're out right now on a spice bush. And the spice bush swallowtail will lay their eggs on this plant and the caterpillars will stay on the plant until it forms its chrysalis. And the butterflies are quite beautiful, as you can see from the photo. Um, and then, <laughs> A lot of folks don't always think of things like trees and shrubs, so as I mentioned, the spice bush, um, as supporting pollinators, but they are really important um, and, uh, because some of them bloom early in the season before some of the wildflowers have had a chance to come out. Hedgerows along farm fields are important pollinator habitat, and important species of trees include things like basswood, birch, cherry, uh, dogwoods have tons of flowers on them, elderberry, maple, oak, uh, raspberry, serviceberry, and many species of willow. I was told by uh, somebody who's really into insects and, um, and uh, butterflies, pollinators, and things like that, that an oak tree is one of the most uh, beneficial plants that you can put on your property in terms of attracting various forms of wildlife. Some of the habitat challenges that we have here in Niagara are invasive species. So invasive species, um, we'll talk a little bit more specifically about what that means. Habitat fragmentation, so, so losing that connectivity between natural areas. And then of course, balancing human needs with the environmental needs um, is, is always a challenge, especially Niagara. It's a, you know, there's a reason people like to live here. It's the same reason that we have a lot of animal species here. It's a beautiful climate, a beautiful area. We have lots of, lots of nice uh, natural resources here. So what are native plants and why are they important to pollinators? Native plants are naturally occurring from the area. So they were here prior to European settlement and they've evolved here. So native plants are okay with our clay soils that make many gardeners grumble um, and they are okay with the amount of rain that we get they're okay with our long cold winters and our wet springs and they're completely adapted to all of these things so just some terminology to get through here um, and i just uh, sometimes when I'm doing this presentation in person, people always ask, what are the different species in the, in the photos? So at the top is a butterfly milkweed plant, and the bottom is a wild bergamot. And in this photo is a swamp milkweed, so it's a different type of milkweed that grows in wetter areas. So some of the terminology, so native are species that occur naturally within the boundaries of a jurisdiction. Exotic or alien are non-native species that are introduced to a location outside of its natural area. An invasive species is something that is hardy and tolerant and that can overtake and displace native species. So not all non-native species become invasive. So a Japanese maple is a type of, of maple tree that is horticultural variety, lots of people have it in their property, and it doesn't really cause problems in natural areas. However, the Crimson King um, maple tree, the, the one with the, the, the red leaves all year round, um, is called a Norway maple. And that particular species gets into natural areas and then it outcompetes the native sugar maples and red maples for their habitat. And it's very aggressive and it's very, very, creates a very dense shade and nothing else can grow underneath it. So not all garden horticultural variety you know, introduced species become invasive. Invasive is very specific terminology used for those plants that sort of take over those natural areas and become really problematic for the native populations. And then a weed is any plant, native or exotic, that is not wanted by humans in their garden. <laughs> um, so I, I have differences of opinion often with my, my mom about which species are a weed and which species are not in my garden. <laughs> 
<laughs> she uh, would, you know, often come over and say, oh, you know, you have goldenrod growing in your garden. That's a weed. And I would say, no, I like it because, you know, the bees like it. And so um, a weed is just, you know, a term that we use as humans for anything that we don't want in our gardens. Are there any questions right now? Annie, should I take a pause? Because it looks like there's a couple in the chat, but if you want me to wait till the end. So somebody just did ask, should we cut down plants uh, such as monad in the fall so it can be habitat or leave it standing? Um, any, so any plants that are in your garden, um, I usually just leave any stems. I don't cut them at all. Some people cut them and leave them, you know, uh, like a foot or so off the ground. I always just leave mine as is, as they would be in nature. Nobody goes around cutting them in the forest. So I always just leave my plants. It's probably more of a personal opinion thing. And I didn't hear the plant species. Did you say Mona? It said M O Monarda. Maybe it's just a typo. Uh, or Mo, W M O W. Uh, it says M O N A D. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe we'll ask for clarification on that one after. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. And that was the only chat? Uh, correct. Okay. I always just feel like I ramble on. So <laughs> I always, uh, you know, I'm used to having conversations with people while we're doing these things. Um, so using native plants has many advantages. Um, native plants are resistant to drought, disease, um, and nutrient poor soils. So as I mentioned, the native plants from Niagara are used to those lovely clay soils that we have. Their roots are adapted. They can, you know, make their way through that thick, thick soil. They provide erosion control and filtration for pesticides, and fertilizers, and other things like that that we don't want in our water. They, they live long and they're perennial. So they come back every year so you don't have to buy new ones. They are an abundant seed source. So once you've planted them in your garden, they can easily be split and shared with your neighbors or your family members, or you can collect the seed and grow more. There's lots of different options there. Um, they will help create more diversity in your garden. And some of the, I put co-benefits. So once you start creating habitat for pollinators, you're also going to create habitat for other types of wildlife in your garden and um, have other benefits such as, you know, diversifying the landscape and contributing to things like, you know, climate change resistance and drought control or flood control and things like that. Um, some of the disadvantages of using native plants is that they can be unpredictable sometimes in their germination and growth. So when you get a native plant and you put it in a spot that it's really happy, it will grow really well and it will do great. And if you put a plant that really likes wet soil and you put it in a really dry area, then it's not going to be as happy and, and may not grow so well. Um, but those, you know, so those habitat feature, um, habitat types are, are well defined for the most part. It is really, really difficult. The difficulty, the hardest part about planting native plants is that they're really hard to find. Um, they're not often available at commercial greenhouses. When you go stop in at Azares or Canadian Tire, um, the, the plants that are available for sale there are often, uh, you know, horticultural varieties of native plants. So you may be able to find a Monarda, like a bee balm or something like that, or a, or a Black Eyed Susan, but it's not the truly native version of that plant. So there's horticultural varieties of native plants, which are not the same as a plant that is seed sourced and grown from a natural plant source. So that is a really big distinction to make. And one pretty easy clue that you can have as to whether something is truly native or not is that horticultural varieties will often have like a little cutesy name to go along with the species name. So like I mentioned, the Norway maple has the Crimson King or um, certain types of maple trees will have, you know, Autumn Blaze or something like that. Like they'll have another name besides their scientific name or their common name, like a, like a bee bomb. They'll have, you know, red ruby or something like that. So when you're looking for truly native plants, you should always seek out plants that were sourced in um, this area. That, and um, near the end of the presentation, we, we will provide you with um, some of those tips in terms of if you're actually going out to buy native plants. And the Conservation Authority does have a list of native plant suppliers available to anybody who's interested. 
And I think one of the local suppliers that's here in Welland was perhaps doing a plant sale in May. So I may will I will try to find out if that is actually still happening and maybe share that information with Annie to uh, to share with others. Um, if anyone in the local area of Welland is looking, the closest one that I'm aware of is right before the um, Humberstone landfill. There's Plants Choice and there are some native plants for sale there. Um, oftentimes there are issues with um, properties, not oftentimes, there may be issues with property standards bylaws with some types of native plants. So milkweed is an example of a plant that was on the noxious weed list for years and years and years and people were ripping it out, taking it out of their properties. Um, and sometimes because the plants can look messy or weedy, um, you may have uh, neighbors that might complain that your garden looks messy or something like that. So depending on what neighborhood you live in and what the rules are, you just may want to look into that before planting some of these really tall species. Um, and so the other um, disadvantage is that sometimes some of those taller species can look sort of messy and not well maintained as they get, you know, really, really out of hand, like a goldenrod gets really, really tall and some types of sunflowers, things like that. So native, these native species will attract native pollinators a lot better than non-native plants. So if you were to plant a horticultural variety um, species right next to a native of the same species, you would probably find much more pollinators and insects going to the native, the native plant. Um, this is a photo actually from my own garden of, of it's called the Virginia Mountain Mint. And at any point in the summertime, I can go to that plant and find at least 10 different types of bees and insects visiting that plant. They just love it. And uh, it's really has a, get a, gets a lot of attention. And I should mention that a lot of people are afraid to plant pollinator friendly plants in their backyard because they're worried about bee stings and things like that. And I should just mention that for the most part, native pollinators are not the types that are going to sort of aggressively sting you unless you're walking right through the garden or you know trying to catch them with your hands they're not aggressive like a yellow jacket that's going to sort of come after you while you're eating your hamburger um, native pollinators tend to just sort of stick to their own food source um, so this is just to show some of the things that we talked about earlier um, in a more visual way so the root system of native plants are so deep that they can access that underground water and that's why in you know those summers that we have those long droughts where we don't get any rain the native plants are usually the only ones that are doing well in my garden <laughs> um, the the very first item on this photo on the far left is a kentucky bluegrass and you can see that grass has basically no root system at all, if, if maybe an inch at the most, not quite. Um, whereas any of these native plants have really, really deep roots and that's why they are drought resistant. That's the reason that you don't have to water them. That's the reason that they can withstand, you know, two weeks without rain and still be blooming and looking lovely because they're able to access that groundwater. Um, just a quick little note about seed zones. I know I talked about it a little bit earlier it just the seed zones have to do with how the plant grows biologically and what it's doing at different times of the year so when you're bringing a red oak from Algonquin Park down to Niagara it's going to have a completely different um, growth period than it would when it's up north so just keeping that in mind that uh, these things are you know there's biological systems in place and you can't just move plants from one place to another and expect that they're going to grow just as well that all these you know this is all timing based on the daylight hours that they're supposed to get and the the length of the season and the amount of rain that they're used to getting this is you know the process of evolution for many many years that has you know put them into these different seed zones so just sort of keep that in mind so some tips for buying native plants is to ask for the geographic source of the stock. Where did it come from? Where did the seeds come from? Um, and always choose those local seed sources when they're available. Um, in the photo here, I have in the zone, which is a tag that goes on some types of plant material. And I would 
think I was told that they are now selling them at some of the Loblaws stores. Um, so that if you see this, this particular tag that in the zone, um, it's a program that was developed through Caroline in Canada to try and make it easier for people to spot out those native plants when they're looking for plant material. So that's one example of a type of native plant that you know is from the right seed source and right in the right area. Um, the locally derived uh, seed or stock is going to be adapted again to our soils or temperatures and even insects and diseases. Um, they'll be more resistant to the types of pests that we have. They're more likely to survive and they're less likely to bring um, disease or genetic adaptations from other zones. So these are just some beautiful examples of some of our native plants. Um, the top left corner is something called a pale purple coneflower, which is a somewhat more uh, rare version of the echinacea plant that we all see um, at the garden centers. Um, the middle is a bee balm, which is a native species of Monarda. Um, the yellow flower with the orange center on the right is called a sweet oxide daisy, another one that gets quite tall and uh, is a favorite of, of butterflies and bees. Um, bottom right corner is, I'm sure everyone recognizes that as goldenrod, which is often associated with uh, people thinking that they have allergies and again, like my mother thinks it's a weed, um, but it, it is that really, really important fall food source for, for native pollinators. Um, Liatris is this middle one, the purple sort of um, spiky plant. That's one that you often see in cut flowers and it is a beautiful uh, native, native plant, also called Liatris. Butterfly milkweed is the orange plant. And then on the left, I thought it would be a good idea to include aquatic plants as well, because often people have um, flower gardens, or sorry, <laughs> um, ponds and little water gardens in their yards. And even something really small like that can be a way to include native plants. So this is a native pickerel weed that grows in lakes and uh, streams in Ontario. And it, again, is a beautiful little plant. Um, another type is the... Uh, blue flag iris, which is another type of aquatic plant. And there's some types of uh, native lilies, uh, lily pads and things like that as well. Arrow, arrowhead is another type of uh, aquatic plant. So these native plants will again attract those native critters. Um, in the middle photo with the hummingbird, that's a cardinal flower. It's one of my favorite flowers in all of Ontario. It's always a special treat to see it growing in the wild because it's got such a vibrant red color. And so you can imagine with that bright, bright red color, you're gonna attract these beautiful hummingbirds to your garden. And the photo um, on the right with the purple flower, that's the New England aster I was mentioning earlier, which is again, that fall food source. So how can we make a difference in Niagara? How can we help our native pollinators? Um, partnerships is one way. As the Conservation Authority, we rely on many, many partnerships with municipalities, private landowners, conservation clubs, rotary clubs, businesses, school boards, community groups, Indigenous friendship centers, stewardship groups, to further our conservation goals of um, natural habitat and restoration in this area. So this is um, an example of a project that we did to do invasive species control in Niagara-on-the-Lake with the Friends of One Mile Creek. So Friends of One Mile Creek are a local community group that are interested in restoring the One Mile Creek watershed. And what we did with this project was we were removing the invasive yellow flag iris in the photo and replacing it with the blue flag iris. So we removed the yellow flag iris from the roadside ditches, which is what was in these garbage bags along the side of the road. And then anybody who lived in the area who had yellow flag iris growing in their backyard, uh, we were offering to come and dig it out and replace it with um, the blue flag iris. This was a, um, a pilot project that we had specific funding for, so it is not something that we can offer at this time, but it is just an example of something that we are doing to try to encourage people to get away from those yellow irises and replace them with a, a native species. And there's an excellent guide I'll, I'll again share with Annie or maybe set um, a link at the end of the presentation. Um, there's an excellent 
guide through the Ontario Invasive Plant Council called Grow Me Instead. And it's a, a brochure that basically highlights native alternatives to common invasive species that people plant in their gardens. So periwinkle is an example that gets naturalized and ends up all over the place. And um, some of these sort of uh, pachysandra is another type. So these sort of invasive species and what is a native alternative to them. And this is another example of a restoration project. So again, in the photo, you can see those beautiful cardinal flower and some Joe pie weed. Um, this was a private landowner who wanted to do a restoration project on their property to try and improve the water quality in One Mile Creek. And we worked with them to establish a whole um, diversity of native plants as opposed to the one species monoculture of reed canary grass, which is an invasive species. So the black, <laughs> lovely plastic that you see in the photo was us trying to smother that reed canary grass. And luckily the landowner was okay with having that ugly plastic on their property for a whole year so that we could try and kill as much of the reed canary grass as possible. And then we replanted with native species. And so the photos with the flowers in them are, you know, sort of the next growing season. And this property actually ended up being part of the uh, Niagara on the Lake um, garden tour one year, which I was surprised to see because uh, these sort of more wild areas aren't always considered to be, but they had a lot of manicured gardens on the property as well. This was sort of the, the more natural space. Um, we did a really interesting partnership a few years ago with the Penn Center where they had a, a green committee and they have a flower budget every year. And they decided that instead of putting their flower budget towards only annual plants to be, you know, hanging baskets and potted things around the property that they wanted to do the right thing. And so they planted pollinator gardens in the medians and the little islands in their parking lot and had so much success with, um, with them and you know, realized that they wouldn't have to buy new plants again the next year, that they, the following year, they ended up making two more pollinator gardens. So if you go to the Penn Center, there's a few of these around and there's, um, some of them have signage saying what the pollinator plants are. And so it was a really great um, opportunity where this was just a matter of, you know, the business had funding available and the Conservation Authority just helped lend the sort of expertise as to what plants to choose and where to get them from. And it was a really great um, success there. Um, this is the uh, Mickey DeFruccio and Family Legacy Pollinator Project. So this is a project that was initiated a few years ago. Uh, Mickey DeFruggio was a NPCA board member for nearly 25 years. He celebrated his 94th birthday this year. And I think every chance he got at a board meeting, he would say, we need to do something to help the monarch butterflies and we need to do something to help pollinators. So in Mickey's honor, we started this pollinator legacy project. And our goal is to plant one pollinator garden in each municipality in our watershed. And we're doing about two or three per year. So last year we did one in Niagara Falls in the Fairview Cemetery, which was an interesting new place for us to put a pollinator garden in a cemetery. And it worked really well because the city staff are there often so they can help maintain it. And the city of Niagara Falls has a Communities in Bloom pro, um, program where residents come out and help with that sort of project as well. And then we also planted one at H.H. Knoll Park in Port Coburn with the city of Port Coburn as well as their Port Coburn Garden Club. So we have not put one in the city of Welland yet. So if anybody has any ideas um, of a good location that uh, would be um, agreeable to having a pollinator garden, I'd be happy to speak with you or, or learn more or discuss that. Um, we do have a couple lined up for this year already, but certainly happy to start that conversation. Um, another project that we did with the city of Welland was um, the canal lands. So the canal lands on the recreational canal, the city was mowing the part. Um, and again, if I was in person, I could point more easily. But on this photo, basically from the path down to the edge of the water was being mown every time they were mowing the rest of the grass um, along the canal lands there. And so... Um, I spoke with the city of Welland and because I started to notice that there were milkweed coming up and then they would just get mown down and oftentimes there'd be, you know, butterflies around. And so I just spoke with the city of Welland and said, hey, what, what do you think about not mowing this 
all, all through the year and maybe just mowing it in the fall or the spring. And they were open to the idea. So with just that one conversation, we protected five kilometers of milkweed and other types of um, pollinator habitat. And it didn't cost the city of Welland any money. And in fact, likely saved them some money because they were doing less work. And um, the seed bank was already there in the soil. So just by stopping the mowing, that whole area is now protected. And there are tons of monarch butterflies there um, laying their eggs and and uh, the caterpillars are growing up and flying away. So it's a really great success story that again didn't have to have a huge cost or a huge budget and it was a really great um, example of a partnership. Uh, Maple Park in Welland is another example and these photos are actually quite old because if anybody's driven by the pool at Maple Park now these trees are huge. Um, these were planted in 2007 so we planted native pollinator um, plants as well as trees along the little what people would call a ditch but it's a little water course that runs through the Maple Park in Welland and again this was you know the water quality was poor in this little creek and the grass was mown right up to the edge so there were erosion problems and algae was growing and things like that and so we worked with the city of Welland to create a buffer um, because this was an important stretch of creek that leads into the Welland River and the city of Welland was open to the idea and we partnered with the Niagara Restoration Council who provided some budget for the project as well and now if you drive by this these trees are 20 feet tall and the whole area is all natural now and it looks really nice in my opinion. <laughs> creating you know a little bit of habitat in in an otherwise fairly manicured area so again these are sort of before and after photos of the uh, the, the water course that runs through Maple Park. Uh, this is a project that we did with the Niagara Parks Commission so they were having some concerns about water quality with all the geese around on the parkway and it was because of all the mown grass. Um, so we did a 400 meter naturalized buffer with native wildflowers and grasses and after two years um, the, the geese count the goose counts were down quite a bit and then this was all a natural area that could be enjoyed by many different types of wildlife um, but not the geese <laughs> i'm sure they found another place to go because they're everywhere so why do we need to have so many partners? Why do we need to have everybody involved? Why do we look to private landowners and, and um, community groups and things like that? We live in a really special area in, in this part of the world. Um, it's known as the Carolinian zone. So it's a, a narrow area at the you know, south part of Ontario where certain species will only grow here and will not grow any further north than this. We have 25% of Canada's population on 0.25% of its area. There are more endangered and rare species than any other life zone in Canada. And 98% um, of the landscape is privately owned here in, uh, in, Carolinian, in the Carolinian zone in general. Um, and 73% is in pr uh, highly productive agriculture. So we have these you know, wonderful agricultural lands and uh, these beautiful uh, beautiful natural areas. So if 98% of the landscape is privately owned, then, you know, if everybody did a little something that would add up to quite a bit. And so just having people recognize how special this area is in terms of the habitat that it provides to a wide variety of wildlife and different types of species of plants. There's, you know, tulip trees and sassafras trees and black cherries and spice bush and things that don't grow any further north um, than this area. So just making sure everybody knows how special it is here. Um, and then why do we need pollinators? Well, I think we all realize that pollinators are directly connected to our food source. 75% um, of all flowering plants depend on pollinators, 30% of our food crops. Um, so these are some significant ecosystem benefits that we get for free from those pollinators. And uh, I did not realize this until the last few years that some types of pollinators are actually transported from Ontario to um, the East Coast to pollinate blueberry patches because it's so effective that 
um, they, they, it, you know, it's worth the money to transport bees um, to the other side of our, of our beautiful country to pollinate butter, um, blueberry patches because the, the reproduction and the, um, the productivity of those bushes accelerates with the pollination from nature. So just these little things that we don't often think about when we're eating blueberries. So some of the little things that people can do to improve habitat on their own property is things like removing invasive species. So if everybody helped a little bit with that problem, uh, we can make a bigger impact. Planting appropriate native species. So looking at what those requirements are in terms of if it's a water loving species versus it likes dry full sun. Um, reducing or eliminating the use of chemical pesticides and fertilizers. Reducing the amount of mown grass. When I drive around Niagara, um, I often see huge areas of private land that is mown. <laughs> and uh, I, I just think that if everybody, you know, sort of gave a piece back uh, to nature and naturalized certain parts of their property that they they don't use it for, you know, playing soccer or something that, you know, you need to have that moan area um, that we can make a really big impact if we collectively work towards something like that. Even something like a small backyard pond for frogs and, and different types of pollinators is really effective. Um, another type of backyard project is a rain garden. So uh, downstream of a, you know, a disconnected downspout off of your home, a, a rain garden can help absorb that excess water and keep it away from your house and your basement. No project is too small, so I know that a lot of people live in apartments or, you know, community condos and things like that, but even a potted plant on your patio or something like that can even have an impact, so don't think that um, any project is, is too small to get started. Some of the resources that are available, um, I forgot to add the Grow Me Instead guide to this list, so I will add that after. Um, the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority has a native plant guide which highlights all of those um, different habitat types that and what native plants grow best in them. So that's something that is available as a downloadable, sorry my, my dog is getting annoyed from being trapped in this room with me. Um, the native plant guide is downloadable or a hard copy can be made available as well. There's a pollinator habitat guide for anybody who's getting started on building a pollinator garden in their yard about, you know, the do's and don'ts and what kinds of things to do in terms of maintenance at the end of the year and all those sort of tips. Um, we have a native plant supplier list as well as a landowner stewardship guide. And like I mentioned before, there's lists of butterflies and their host plants, some woodland plants if people are growing in heavily shaded areas. Um, we do have butterfly garden seed packs, which I'm going to drop off um, to Annie once the library is open to the public again, so people can sort of pick them up while they're there picking up some books. And then Carolinian Canada has some really great resources on their website. They're doing a project or a program called Grow Canada's Largest Wildlife Garden, and they want people that are doing backyard projects to um, track them and input them into their their program um, so that we can track over time how big that habitat is getting if everybody's contributing that small piece. So it's a way of sort of putting some metrics behind that. And the one thing I didn't touch on too, too much, but the restoration grant program is something that uh, if people have a larger property and they're looking at doing something more substantial, like a larger tree planting or a larger meadow habitat or something more significant, then there are possibly resources um, like funding resources available through the Conservation Authority. We have a restoration grant program and the aims of those pro that program is to improve water quality and improve habitat. So if you think that you might have a project like that, um, feel free to reach out to me and I can put you in touch with the right staff person. Um, and then they just, you know, they have a certain amount of resources available every year. And so whatever projects come in, they review them and then decide which ones can go forward with funding. And that is the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. I've included my 
e, uh, my email here if anybody has something that pops up in their head afterwards. I'm happy to answer any questions. So let me just read, there's a couple of questions. Um, sure. Uh, what is the minimum size of a backyard pond that would be beneficial and should it be in sun or shade? Okay. Um, I don't think there's any minimum size. I think any, any water uh, feature that you have in your backyard, whether it's a pot filled with water that has a few plants in it or whether it's, you know, a little, you know, three foot by two foot uh, garden our water garden. Uh, I think it will have benefits no matter what. Sorry, I'm just going to let my dog out of here. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I think that no matter what you're, you know, if you have just a little bit of water, it could be even something as small like a bird bath that's providing, you know, water to butterflies and birds and things like that. Or it can be something that is a little bit bigger. So I think there is no minimum size. Um, you know, people often think of ponds as these great big things. I, I have a backyard pond that has, it's maybe four feet wide by two or three feet in different spaces. And there's frogs that live in there and fish and things like that. It's it just, there, I don't think there's a real uh, minimum size. Sorry if that's not very helpful. <laughs> General. So uh, I think the question before was, should we cut down plants such as, remember there wasn't, they corrected it to, the, it to Monarda? Is that a- Oh, Monarda. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The root, is that a neat? The red Monarda, is, there is the native, it's called Bee Balm. It's really, really hard to find the the truly native version of that plant. What you'll often find is the wild bergamot. Um, it's a more kind of pinky purple version of that plant that it's more easily found. I'm not saying you can't, you, you can certainly source it out, but it's a lot harder to find than the, the sort of pinky purple one, but it is native and it's, uh, it's beautiful. <laughs> and um, sorry to go back to the question about the sun or shade for the pond. Um, I think with any type of water feature, it's a good idea to have it sort of um, partial sun, um, but not full sun. Full sun would probably lead to lots of algae growth unless you had it really, really full of aquatic vegetation. So something that's sort of part sun, part shade, or it gets morning sun, but afternoon shade is beneficial. Something that's in the full sun is just sometimes if it's small, it'll just heat up too much and it won't grow, um, it won't grow the plants properly and things like that. Great. Um, and I asked the question about um, the native plant lists or the yep. plants that you talked about it. Um, sorry, here, I'll uh, put my face up so you can see me. <laughs> there you go. Um, so I did find, I did find um, a, a place actually online out of Hamilton called Native Plants Ontario. Okay. That does um, actually ship native plants. But I was curious, um, I just moved down to Welland. So I was curious about the commercial um, nurseries. So you can't like, so if I found bee balm, if it had some mean to it, then that's not native, even if it says like is great for butterflies. Yeah, so it would still likely attract some butterflies, but not mm -hmm. as well as the truly native seed sourced evolved here version of that plant. Okay. Because I, I do, I know the red, the red um, Monarda is for sale at lots of garden centers. I've seen it, um, but it's finding that, that um, the native seed source, the local seed source for it. Okay. Are you familiar with the, on they're, at, they're in Hamilton. It's called Ontario Native Plants. It, it's not off the top of my head, um, okay. but I, I, um, it, I mean, if they're called Ontario Native Plants, I'm sure that they, they are a source of, I would hope um, that they are a source of native plants. It just may not have, if it's a fairly new company, like we usually review our list once per year. So mm -hmm. if it's fairly new, it just might not have made it on our list yet, but I, I would have to check. Okay. I can send you a link to it if you like. Sure. That'd be great. 
Yeah, I can do that. They do, um, and they're not seeds. They don't sell seeds. They actually sell plants. And plants, they sell okay. And small plants, and they ship them. And because I was looking for native, because I moved into a house um, that has some existing plants, so I want to get rid of, like, they, I have a lot of hostas and things mm -hmm. like that, and I want to, like, move away from that. But I was curious about garden centers, and I was a bit, um, so... They would be the ones you said that had that Ontario or true. What did you say? Uh, so, so there's the in the zone um, labels oh, yeah, that the are zone. sometimes found on certain types. Um, okay. Not that's not to say that every native plant has to have that in the zone label, yeah. um, but just talk to the gardeners that are at the at the center because I do I do know and I don't know if it's law of laws across Canada, but I do know that Carolini in Canada told me that they did. Uh, reach some type of partnership with Loblaws and they were going to start selling native plants. But like I said, I don't know if it's like every Loblaws store in all of Ontario or if it's just, you know, a, a few pilot projects across the area. I'm not, I'm not certain on that. I did hear that too, um, They because they were advertising that. Um, I used to live in Mississauga, so they were advertising oh, Okay. So. Okay. Excellent. So I just, um, I was mostly curious about the nursery, so I'll do that. Yeah. So thank you. You're welcome. This is exciting Hello, to hear Carrie. everybody that's... Can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you. I, it's hot. You probably can't see me because I can't figure this out. But anyway, I, I, you, but I, I can have, hear you just fine. Just fine. Okay, I have grown a bee balm in my garden in Welland and it is very invasive and okay. it is okay. subject to uh, the mildew fungus. Yes. The milky, yes. you know, the white stuff. Mm -hmm. So I took it out. Okay. I don't know okay. if it was the native one or the other one, but just um, to let you know. Yeah, I find yeah, that mine has, that some, mine mildew has some mildew on it as well. It doesn't well. seem to harm the plant. It's more of an aesthetic more thing. Of an aesthetic uh, mine is in a really uh, dry, really sunny dry location on the south side of my house, and it still gets that mildew on it. I'm not sure what the answer is to that, but it is certainly something that that does happen to those plants in particular. Yeah, I just wanted to share that. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I see that there, <laughs> there's a question that is, why is it so difficult to source native plants yeah. in gardens and nurseries? <laughs> I would love to, uh, that, you know, <laughs> I would love to know the answer to that question. Um, I, I have thought for many years it would be really interesting to have, um, local nurseries even sell native plants on consignment or something like that just to kind of support that that idea and I do think it's becoming more evident that people are looking for native plants so I, I suspect that in the future it won't be so difficult but that's one of the reasons that Carolini and Canada started the whole in the zone program and the grow Canada's largest wildflower gardens because they were hearing that frustration from people that they couldn't find native plants and where you know where do you go to find them and so part of their program is to not only um, highlight the importance of native plants but also to highlight the native plant suppliers and the native plant growers and market them because most of them are um, you know very small businesses that are run by a few people that don't have the staffing and the resources to spend time marketing like a big company like Loblaws or something like that right they're just these little um, small operations and they're often uh, um, you know just trying to keep up with the with the business and they're just starting some of them um, some of the more established ones are a little bit more I saw somebody mentioned K&A's um, that is one of the ones I believe that is on our list. Um, there's one in St. Williams that's fairly, um, fairly well established. And then, like I said, there's the one here in Welland called Sassafras Farms that sells native plants as well. So there are some, they're just, they're not as great as, <laughs> as of uh, marketing themselves, unfortunately. Were there any other questions? Annie, is there a, a way of like easily sharing links to the resources that we have available or? Um... I can. Um, so you sent, uh, Carrie sent me some of the handouts I have. Um, I can email them to the people that registered. I would have their email addresses. Okay. 
if they didn't register and just came on Zoom, if they email me, then I can email them the attachments. Okay. Um, and if, so and if anybody's be. looking for hard copies of things like the native plant guide, if you're like me, you like to have it out in the garden with you instead of looking at it on a computer screen, uh, feel free to send me a message and we can have a copy mailed out to you. Um, uh, same with the butterfly seeds and uh, any other resources I'm trying to think of. Oh, the Grow Me Instead brochure. I'm going to send a link to that in the chat if that's okay. Is there any other questions? Quiet group. So we did record the session tonight. So shortly it will be up on our YouTube channel. So hopefully the links that you put in at the end will be there as well. Oh, okay, great. Okay. Yeah, I don't know whether the chat comes up or not, but no, uh, it does either. But um, if not, I can add them at the bottom. It's a really easy Google search for just Grow Me Instead Ontario, and it'll come up. But I, I did put the link in there for anybody that was interested. Great. Well, thank you, Carrie. Any more questions from anybody? <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. So Carrie is back with us on. I believe it's June 8th at six o'clock and she's going to be talking about the conservation authorities. Uh, it's called nature in our backyard. So some of the great hiking trails. Um, so that would be a really good one. So it'll be a good family one too, if you have kids and um, we'll see her then. For sure. Um, I'm happy to, to see all this engagement and so many people interested. And um, again, if you have any questions, please reach out and, and don't be shy. <laughs> So thank you for the opportunity, Annie. Thanks for everybody for tuning in. And uh, we'll see you in June. Yes, we'll see you in June. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Take care. Night, everyone. Thank you. Bye.